Well, let me say welcome to reorienting ourselves to the reality of not yet. Uh, my name is Dr. Gary Green. I am a faculty person here at United. I teach uh, pastoral theology and social transformation, and I also have the privilege of directing our anti-racist initiative. So tonight's event is officially a launch of the second wave of those initiatives. For those of you all who have already been here and know what we've been doing, you know we've been developing our internal vernacular over the course of the last year. And now we're shifting our attention to public engagement and student formation. And so this, this panel event tonight is about anti-racism. Um, and it's an invitation for us to think about it differently and to re-engage it creatively. Um, the title of this panel is a play on the theological concept already not yet. Um, which holds together the fact that our present work is an active participation in building the hope for a world we imagine, even while we acknowledge that that world has not fully come to fruition yet, the not yet part of it. Um, and as that relates specifically to anti-racism, I mean to say this very plainly. We can talk all day about DEI and anti-racism, but we also need to understand the kind of commitment uh, and creative engagement it requires to bring about a reality that does not already exist, despite how much we say we want it to. And so welcome to tonight's event. This, it's meant to be a, another beginning to this conversation into anti-racism. <clears throat> what we're gonna do first is I'm going to introduce the distinguished guests that we have with us tonight because I don't have all the answers to anti-racism but Dr. Danielle Fuentes Morgan and, and, and Teresa Moses do. And so I have invited them to come and, and solve all of the issues tonight. Um, and so before we screen an original production that the faculty has been working on and, um, and that kind of tells our story about anti-racism and how we're approaching this work here at United, I want to introduce our guests. And we'll go directly into the film and then after the film, we will be, we will be in our panel conversation, and, and we will have some time for Q&A at the end of tonight's uh, conversation. So I am joined by, uh, first of all, Teresa Moses. Teresa is the creative director at Blackbird Revolt, a social justice-based design studio, um, and is also assistant professor of graphic design and the director of design justice at the University of Minnesota's College of Design. That's in Duluth, right? Oh, okay, here, okay. I don't know where I thought you, okay, perfect. Okay, all right, so I'm not completely crazy. Um, Teresa is also a community engaged scholar whose design interests and previous works include Project Natural, which creates spaces to educate, connect, and empower black women about their natural hair and self identity, and Racism Untaught, a curriculum model that reveals racialized design and helps students, educators, and organizations create anti-racist concepts through the design research process. And uh, a book after the same title, which came out October 3rd, right? And you have another one coming out October 31st, entitled? Anthology of Blackness. Anthology of Blackness. So we're excited to celebrate those works and be engaged by them. Um, <clears throat> uh, Teresa holds a BFA in fashion design and African American studies from North Texas University, University of North Texas. Uh, MFA in design research and anthropology and is a PhD candidate um, in social justice education at the University of Toronto. Teresa, thank you for being with us and welcome. <laughs> Dr. Danielle Fuentes Morgan is associate professor at Santa Clara University in the Department of English with a courtesy appointment in the Department of Ethnic Studies. Uh, she specializes in African-American literature and culture in the 20th and 21st centuries and is particularly interested in the ways literature, mass media, popular culture, and humor shape identity formation. Um, her research and teaching reflect her interest in African-American satire and comedy, which makes her the perfect guest for tonight's uh, conversation. Um, the arts as activism and the continuing influence of history on contemporary articulations of black selfhood. Um, Danielle has written a variety of both scholarly and popular articles and has interviewed and been interviewed on topics as varied as Black Lives Matter, race in the Twilight Zone, black sisterhood in sitcoms, 
the satiric reappropriation of ne negative tropes, laughter as revolution, race and sexuality on the Broadway stage, and Beyonce. Um, and not to mention a four-part documentary series entitled We Need to Talk About Cosby, which grapples with Bill Cosby's comedic legacy and the question of whether it is advisable or even desirable to separate the art from the artist. Um, she's the author of Laughing to Keep from Dying, African-American Satire in the 21st Century, which addresses the contemporary role of African-American satire as a critical realm of social justice. My students can vouch for the engagement with this text uh, and how it opens up ways of seeing uh, differently that allow us ways of relating differently as well. Um, Dr. Danielle has a BA in English with a minor in African American Studies from UNC, an MAT from Duke, an MA in English Literature from North Carolina State, and a PhD from Cornell University. Danielle, welcome and thank you for being with us. And before we engage each other in dialogue, we're going to uh, view an original film that, that we've put together. Um, and I'm excited for you all to see this. It tells the story of how we're trying to approach this work and sets the stage for the conversation we're going to have later. Our approach to anti-racism is based in the belief that for anti-racism to become a reality at United, the praxis must be ongoing and written throughout the life of the institution. A mistake many organizations make, whether related to DEI broadly or anti-racism specifically, is relying solely on occasional workshops or trainings that are content rich and decidedly brief. In other words, they're helpful, but they don't take too much time out of the schedule. The problem with this approach is that it fails to take seriously the productive, ongoing nature and nurture of white supremacy how it exists as a cultural performance that plays out politically and constructs reality at every level, whether everyday interactions or national policies that uphold structures designed to disempower people of color. Learning to live against the current of white supremacy requires the kind of engagement that is more akin to a reconditioning process than best practices that can be mastered and applied. For this reason, we've decided to create an anti-racist rhythm that includes three waves of engagement that will live throughout the complete life of the institution. More specific to our internal work here at United, another unique feature about our approach is that it is intentionally playful and specifically comedic. I grew up a fan of comedy and I was always intrigued by the way stand-up comedians could tell a joke that would temporarily suspend the racialized rules we typically live by, cutting through reality as we knew it and exposing the absurdities of something we all participate in together every day. Now, as a scholar committed to racial justice, I recognize that comedy, and specifically satire, is backed by a cultural and theological history that orients it toward the disruption and remaking of the social order. Comedy brings the kind of chaos you need to critically and creatively unpack centuries of racism. So there are three primary reasons we use a comedic approach. First of all, levity lets us engage each other in difficult conversations about race at a level of depth that typically tense dialogues simply do not allow. It invites us underneath our emotional equilibriums, which are themselves products of our moral commitments and the conclusions we've already drawn. So instead of getting hung up on saying the right thing so I don't sound racist, we enter through a shared recognition of racism's absurdity in a way that can laugh at it and we can take a step back with an agreement to engage each other more authentically and vulnerably for the sake of learning which connects to the second reason we take a comedic approach. Comedy exposes the absurdity of white supremacy. It reminds us that the racialized rules we live by are all made up, and yet they're oriented politically toward the maintenance of racist realities. Yet comedy helps us learn to see the relational science of it all in real time. 
to recognize how race plays out in both mundane and monumental ways, which gives us the kind of cultural dexterity we need to live more creatively and in relation to the world we want to create. But finally, comedy exists in and invites us collectively into play space, which is inherently dangerous. We recognize that harm can be done from certain kinds of jokes being told, and so we don't take that for granted. But what we do recognize is that comedy and play space gives us an opportunity to engage each other in a different way. It is a set aside space, which is really kind of has a sacred component to it if entered into mindfully. And so rather than assume that these shared spaces we share are already safe, oh, we enter in safe space, we recognize that it's not safe for everybody when we enter in with that presumption. But when we enter in knowing that there's an inherent danger and possibility in play space and comedy, then we are more intentionally careful with the way that we engage each other and creating a circumstance that can be safe for everybody to show up in their full selves. From my personal context as a spiritual care provider, I see anti-racism as an ethic of care rooted in cultural humility, rooted in intersectionality, and rooted in critical self-reflection. Um, it's a way for those who are engaged in interpersonal relationships to dive deeply into authentic relationship that values the entire person. Very recently, the Unitarian Universalist Association has begun to discuss the possibility of adopting an eighth principle to add to its current list of seven principles. And this principle is specifically focused on anti-racism. And uh, the, the wording of the principle is really, really compelling and evocative. And uh, I've written it down so I don't get it wrong. Uh, but here, here's the wording of the principle. It says, what we seek to journey toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. I like how it focuses on both the systemic and the personal dimensions of needing to do anti-racism work. So I think we need to confront and dismantle white supremacy and racism at uh, the structural level, uh, the ways in which it poisons our societies, our cultures, our nations, our laws, our churches, our religious institutions. But we also need to pay attention to the ways in which racism poisons our own soul. And I think this involves paying attention to our personal and cultural histories and the ways in which they shape our attitudes about race. I think sometimes there's a tendency to, uh, and I'll say explicitly for white people, to shy away from a framing of anti-racism because it sounds negative, <laughs> which it is. I mean, it's a negation or a countering of something. And instead, I think sometimes folks prefer to use language of like racial justice or, um, you know, maybe like uh, dismant, like countering white normativity or something like that. And those are all fine constructions. But in my opinion, it's really essential that we use the langu language of anti-racism um, because it I mean, there's no perfect terms, but I think it accurately gets at some of this work of countering and dismantling those systems of oppression, particularly around race. For me, anti-racism means um, a political struggle, that these ways we see ourselves and one another isn't just uh, natural, that that's a product of a history. Uh, Christina Sharp speaks about um, the afterlives of chattel slavery as a kind of wake traveling behind those slave ships that traverse the Middle Passage. And so I've begun to think about the political side of anti-racism as a struggle to kind of recognize the way that those powers have shaped how we see and shaped our communities, shaped our polity. When something like 
racism affects how we see ourselves and one another, how we understand the divine, that there's something going on that exceeds our ability to even name or grasp or transform on our own power. And so there is a, this intrinsically religious aspect to this that raises questions about our freedom to be transformed. Can we move beyond this? Can we exceed these, this wake that has all of us in its grip? I went to segregated schools growing up in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, they didn't bother ever to enter the curriculum, uh, the story of the massacre at Greenwood, 45 miles away. Uh, the schools, uh, the high school I went to, the white school, Central High of Muskogee, the black school manual training, which suggested that that, that was the outcome intended for the graduates of that school. I think unlearning the ways in which uh, structural racism had set the parameters really for my life uh, is an ongoing quest. Uh, recognizing the, uh, the cultural inequities. Uh, I think now of things that I said or assumed as a child or as an adolescent and I'm ashamed. At one point, I drove over and parked my car in front of manual training high and repented of what I had assumed uh, while I was a high, a high school student. Anti-racism means to me an uh, intentional commitment to create actual change uh, through development of new policies or the changing of policies and institutionalized practices that will disrupt the sort of long heritage that continues to reside in our institutions of uh, racism and biased thinking and prejudice. And um, so anti-racism signifies to me a real, a real commitment to creating change through enacting new policies or changed policies. Anti-racism means to me to work to deliberately undermine the systemic racism uh, in our country and in our world in such a way that it uh, dismantles things that dehumanize, take away dignity, injure uh, parts of humanity on the basis of race. And so to have an anti-racist stance means to, to be working actively to undercut, undermine those systems to bring about the full flourishing of people of color and, and everyone. When I think of anti-racism, I think of all of us being aware of uh, both who we are as people and our, both our strengths and our weaknesses and how we are aware of bringing that to the community, but then also being aware of who our community is and how our community interacts with each other because all interactions are racial interactions. It, do, it doesn't matter who, who we are and who we're interacting with. They all are and have an element of race in them because, of course, race is one of those socially constructed um, realities in our world. Realities in the sense of we have to deal with it. And so I think for me, anti-racism is a lot about being aware of how those dynamics are in play with each other and being sensitive then to both my own strengths and weaknesses but then sensitive to whoever I'm talking to about where they might be in their own uh, in their own journey and in their own process of awareness or lack thereof There are three waves of engagement as part of these anti-racist initiatives. The first wave, which launched in the spring of 23, is about developing our internal vernacular based on the assumption that we must first make sure our house is in order before we can become a leading voice for anti-racism among theological schools and in our local community. This first wave includes two parts. One is the disruptive conversations which is a faculty and staff conversation where the focus is on disrupting and deepening our sometimes surface level understandings of the subtle but productive ways race plays out in everyday life. 
This is the conditioning process for all faculty and staff, where we collectively move through a process of developing the kinds of racial intelligence that translates to intentionality and critical awareness in everyday life and in institutional practices. But there's also IAC, which is Interdepartmental Accountability Check-Ins, where representatives from the Committee Advocating Racial Justice, or CARJ, meet with the departments and leadership um, and assess progress based on previously set intentions, imagine their work together in terms of what it could look like in an anti-racist way, and collaborating to bring it to fruition. Wave two turns attention towards student formation and public engagement. After this first year that we've been spending doing the necessary internal work of developing our internal racial intelligence, we turn our anti-racist attention to the growth and learning of our students and begin to articulate publicly who we aspire to be and how we intend to cultivate a new racial reality in collaboration with the wider community. This second wave consists of anti-racist reorientation videos. These videos feature interviews where each faculty member talks about their unique approach to anti-racism in their teaching, their work as scholars, and their broader hopes for anti-racism in the world. They're designed to direct students' attention to the threads of anti-racist learning that is already woven throughout their courses. So rather than take the workshop approach, where we put all our eggs in the basket of one, maybe two focused class sessions and hope it sticks, this approach drops anchor on the commitments and creative muscle this faculty already exercises, orienting students to the ongoing nurture of anti-racist intelligence in relation to every aspect of theological education, whether biblical studies or black theology. Secondly is the Disrupting White Supremacy podcast. This is based on a conversation series I started a few years ago that features leading black voices who offer unique angles of vision into the nature of white supremacy and who are creatively engaged in the work of anti-racism from different disciplines and professions. And this podcast will relaunch in the spring of 2024. Finally, there's these public reorientation panels of which this event is the first, where we engage the minds of some of the most creative critics of white supremacy, scholars and activists who can help us more clearly and creatively see both its everydayness and the major events that make national news. These panels are designed to facilitate the kinds of dialogue that raise our consciousness as a community, but in a way that bends toward the creativity and cultural dexterity we need to live into anti-racist futures. Wave three is still in its imaginative phase, but this will be where we turn our attention programmatically and explore possibilities and partnerships that can materialize more learning opportunities that address racial disparities and access to theological education and that center voices of color and potential students to come and engage and learn together. If United lived into an anti-racist reality, this space would be transformed. We would center the voices and lived experiences of persons of color, not only the students or the faculty or our staff, but we would center the voices of our entire community. Uh, we would highlight and lift up scholars of color. We would highlight and lift up community members who are change agents who have influenced not only our students' lives, but just the life of United as a whole. I think if we would follow through with our values um, and we would transform theological education, not just here at United, but as a whole, because we would be modeling what it would look like to truly be a space that bends towards justice. When you think about what a hopeful vision of an anti-racist society or community would look like, I think that would be a community where diversity is not you know, something that's surprising or jarring or given to conflict or turf wars and that sort of thing, but that it is really inherent to uh, the sense of community itself and, and expected and where everybody brings their distinct uniquenesses and perspectives and experiences um, equally to bear on kind of creating the, the life and the, 
the, the, the, the togetherness and the society that we, we really should be and want to be. My own tradition, the Christian tradition, tells me that human beings were put here for joy, to rejoice in the goodness of creation. And if racism does anything on a theological level, it inhibits and distorts our joy. That there is something basic and fundamental and ineradicable about our condition as human beings that cannot be stomped out. And I think that that has a real deep insight about what, what anti-racism work should be aiming towards, this kind of abundant joy that human beings were created to experience and that racism has inhibited. And so um, at United, I think that that means celebrating. I think that means uh, looking at the diversity of human beings and uh, racial identities that are here uh, and learning how to inhabit space together in a way that affords joy for everybody and allows us to enjoy one another. To me, um, anti-racism is about creating safety and that safety will look different for every person. So as a community, it's about each of us feeling that way and feeling celebrated and accepted for who we are. Um, we t you know, talk about in diversity, we talk about being aware of, but awareness to me is the first step. It's not quite it's not quite there yet because somebody being aware of who I am is very different than somebody celebrating who I am and in that I feel like I can bring my authentic self yeah. to, to the community. And then as a community that we can be authentic both as a community but then as individuals within that community. An anti-racist United to me looks like someone would walk in these doors and they would take a big sigh of relief because this was a place in which that was a haven away from the racism of our society, of our world. Coming to United would mean that they feel fully equipped to be anti-racist agents in the world. You know, that their churches are gonna be bastions against racism, that their community work is going to be really effective. So we've given them the tools that they need, the, both confidence and humility to go out into a, into a, a world um, that has racism and homophobia and transphobia and sexism and all, all the things that we're fighting against, but they feel like they, they're committed to and equipped to be leaders. Anti-racism work is about building something, right? It's about, it's about building the beloved community. You know, I've always found the notion of beloved community super compelling. It's a concept that originated with the American philosopher Josiah Royce, but was taken up and then significantly developed by Martin Luther King Jr. during the Civil Rights Movement. And for King, beloved community meant a community that was marked by equality and justice, a community that was marked and governed by love and universal loyalty and universal siblinghood. Right? A community where everybody's inherent worth, dignity, humanity are both recognized and honored. What King called our somebodiness. I love that. Yeah, I think that the United faculty uh, has a lot to offer the work of anti racism. Um, you know, the phrase is sometimes used at United, uniquely united. <laughs> And I think the faculty is uniquely united. I think some of the, the things we bring to that conversation is, first of all, just our energy as a faculty and the way that we um, are inspired by each other and just enjoy working alongside of each other, having these conversations. Um, and these are in interdisciplinary conversations. And I think that's really key, the way that we can learn from each other what does anti-racist work look like in your discipline, in your classroom, um, in your experience? And that immediately, you know, we're a small but mighty faculty and I think that immediately enriches the, the conversation. I think the future of theological education, uh, the wholeness of it depends upon a great variety of administrative leaders and faculty and then students kind of follow uh, that 
reality. Um, in this past year, there's, well, the past three years, been quite a churn in terms of turnover in seminary presidencies, but more Hispanic, more black, uh, are moving into key positions as chief academic officers, as well as the CEOs of schools. When that happens, something begins to shift uh, within a system. Honestly, I can say that I'm already pleased with the way the faculty and staff have responded to this invitation. So I'd say my hope is that one day we will reflect and find ourselves embodying anti-racist practices with the same kind of second nature rhythm that white supremacy typically relies on for its survival. That this work will become part of this institution's DNA so that there becomes a culture to our anti-racist commitments that outlives any particular people or personalities that are here. I picture us having formed community partnerships where we collaborate to create new opportunities for learning and organizing. I envision us becoming a space where community activists feel welcome to join this work and strategize with us. And I believe we are already in the process of redefining what it means to do theology in the 21st century. I'm just glad to know that anti-racism will be a centerpiece to this work when we talk about how it's done here at United. So, our first. So the conversation part of tonight is framed basically around two movements. Um, the first has a deconstructive focus, uh, trying to understand the importance of doing the kinds of racial analysis that gives us a fuller understanding of the ways in which racial realities exist as systems that often take on a life of their own. Um, how these systems are perpetuated by people whose ability to understand the regularity of their participation is cloaked by good intentions that can only go as far as, well, I'm not racist because. Taking things apart so we can see them clearly is, a, is an emphasis of tonight's conversation. But there's also a focus on learning how to put things back together better. Uh, a world taken apart by this kind of analysis. In other words, after we have a thicker understanding of white supremacy's insidious nature, how can we begin to lean into our responsibility for recreating ways of being that breathe life on the basis of race rather than suffocate? And so the questions that have been curated for tonight's conversation between these two brilliant scholar activists are designed to give us an opportunity to engage in those two ways. And so, Danielle, I want to begin by asking you a question. And as I mentioned in our conversation, either of you can respond to any of the questions, obviously. Just jump in. Um, but Danielle, one of the ways that I've found it both personally and politically helpful to try to understand white supremacy and the world it has created is by its absurdities. Um, even while we acknowledge and resist the material consequences of it, there's a silliness to the ways whiteness has been constructed as superior, um, a kind of laughable quality to it that feels important to me when it comes to the kinds of analysis uh, and resistance that can inform transformative work. And so my question for you is, can you talk about the ways that comedy and satire can help us understand the nature of white supremacy? in this way. Well, thank you for having me, um, first of all. And I really love this question because it's one that I've been grappling with a lot in my own research and my own engagement, both as a scholar of comedy and a comedy fan. Um, and I think one of the ways uh, comedy and satire in particular help us to understand the absurdity or the asinine quality of white supremacy is by answering the question, how do you satirize a situation when the real life situation feels like a satire? Mm. Um, and I think that's part of what so many of these comedians and satirists, particularly in the 21st century in really bold ways are working with here. Um, they are imagining race and racism and white supremacy out to the most absurd 
conclusion to put this really fine point on the actual existing absurdity. If you think about a movie, for example, um, that I'm sure many of us have seen, something like Get Out, um, and I'll try, you know, I, hopefully you've seen it already. I'll try to avoid any major spoilers, but the, the sort of premise that um, you're imagining how can black bodies be consumed? How are black bodies commodified? And Jordan Peele brilliantly creates a scenario of literal commodification, literal embodiment, so that it makes it easier for us to talk about the actual reality of what that feels like because we have this uh, this elevated absurdity uh, depicted for us. And so I think that's one of the main goals of comedy um, and has always been one of the main goals of comedy is to elevate and blow up the actual absurdity, which provides us a language for talking about our real lives. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Danielle. Teresa, did you want to? Jump in, are you good on Okay. <laughs> um, I'm resisting the temptation to ask follow-up questions because th those will come later. So anyway, um, one of the things I've been reflecting on, Danielle, as it relates to uh, my very early thinking about what a theology of comedy might look like, um, is how comedy brings an incarnational chaos to the social order. Um, which opens up what, what I like to think about as play spaces or portals of possibility, um, where alternatives can be imagined and then become new performances in relation to existing realities. Um, and this way of thinking, I remember engaging your book, it, it about the comedic is akin to the ways that you talk about satire opening up an ethical terrain. And so I'm curious, can you help us understand what you mean by this, by in this concept of ethical terrain and what these moments look like when they're opened up in front of us? So a lot of this ethical terrain is um, about this kind of idea that gets, that can get muddied, um, but this hope that generally speaking for comedians, the most effective comedy is what we call in comedy studies, punching up where somebody who has less power is um, targeting somebody who has more power to comedic effect to make a point about this power inequity. Um, and so that's part of what that ethical terrain does is to remind us of the existing hierarchies in the world. Comedy also beautifully within this con concept of the ethical terrain um, refuses to allow the, um, the hierarchy to be, un it won't let the hierarchy be undisturbed. So it creates a scenario where um, the comedian is pointing out the ridiculousness of the hierarchy uh, by flipping it on its head, um, by imagining the people with more power as, um, you know, being marginalized in some way or losing that status in another way. Um, and creating what I like to talk about as kind of thinking otherwise or reading otherwise. So we know what the reality is, but this ethical terrain opens up a new possibility for us imagining a better world, a better possibility. And a lot of times comedy does this also by thinking about historical fact and turning it into historical fiction or an alternative reality of what's taken place. So when we think about some of these um, satirical shows or comedic shows that seem really fascinated by um, past historical events or sort of playfully reimagining um, the contemporary reality, that it is trying to open up this ethical terrain um, of possibility for, for its audience. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what would you say is the social benefit of this or the social consequence of being confronted with these kind of other ways seeing or you know some of what you talked about is this ethical terrain i'm just curious what what what's the what's the benefit of it for the public i will i think one of the major benefits is realizing that your sense of discomfort in the way things are does not make you an outlier that you are not by yourself in recognizing the absurdity 
of racism, of recognizing the um, brutality of white supremacist uh, of white supremacy. Yeah. Um, you feel you are able, as a result of witnessing these jokes and 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 being a part of this communal laughter, that you're empowered to recognize that there's an entire community of people out there who are experiencing life in a similar realm as you. Um, and that, I mean, that's, for me, that's part of the, um, that's the matter of survival, right? Feeling that you're not isolated, that you're not being marked, that you're not alone in these feelings and then feeling like it's possible to create change because you're not isolated, because you're not alone. So it really becomes, you know, these, these fictions that we imagine become our way of imagining ourselves and imagining the collective ourself as well. You're reminding me of, of my childhood where, you know, I grew up in a house that was very comedic and just in the ways that we interacted uh, with each other. And I can remember some of the conversations that my dad had with me early on that helped to kind of develop this way of seeing reality by nature of the fact of what he knew I was going to have to navigate as a black man in this country. Um, and so I, I reflect personally on how this kind of comedic eye or this comedic sat satirical sensibility has been a part of my formation since I was a child um, and, and how that lives in relation to kind of the social position that I lived with as a black man. I'm curious, what are, what are some of the ways that you imagine white people, for example, in relation to this? If we're thinking about power, privilege, positionality, some of those things, and it's not one-to-one, -one, obviously, but generally speaking, what are some of the ways you imagine white people learning to hone the satirical way of seeing, particularly if they've not been in circumstances that have required it? Um, and I think underneath this is, is really the question of, to what extent do you believe this way of seeing is tied to experiences of being marginalized? And to what extent is it available to whoever can hone it? That's a, that's a complicated and really fascinating question. Um, I think that certainly, you know, white people have their own, um, many white people are marginalized in a variety of right. ways right. and they can recognize um, some of those same contexts as, um, as areas that they themselves want to com combat. When I talk to my students, um, I usually talk about this idea that white supremacy harms us all, right? That it's not just, um, that it's that white supremacy and the patriarchy and all of these kinds of oppressive forces are bad for everyone who, who experiences life under them. Um, I think that in terms of white, audience's reception and their, their feelings of being able to receive this information. Part of what comedians do um, really brilliantly, many comedians in particular, um, especially I'm thinking of, um, you know, uh, early 2000s, Dave Chappelle was really um, skillful at this, making the audience feel like this is somebody who was your friend. Mm -hmm. um, and because they're your friend, you are willing to listen to them. You are willing to allow their comedic stance to chip away at some of your resistance and you're more receptive to the actual message that they're giving. Um, and so I think that's one of the predominant ways uh, white audiences can be um, able to understand this sort of satirical bent, both by um, engaging uh, with their own feelings of marginalization, the recognition, the recognition that um, these oppressive uh, forces oppress all of us and also um, being willing to listen to the comedians without feeling personally attacked. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. And I, that one of the things I tell my students also is, is recognizing, like entering in with the assumption that all this is made up. You know, it's materially consequential, and yet we don't have to do none of this this way, right? And so just knowing that kind of lifts a little bit and opens possibilities for then how do we want to think about how we want to engage this reality together if we know it does not have to be this way? Um, thank you, Daniel. I'm going to shift gears to, to Teresa now uh, before we kind of get into some more free-flowing dialogue. So 
Tedesa, I previously acknowledged the material consequences of white supremacy, right? We know that, there, that it's not just a construct that lives in the ether, but it creates reality. Um, that, that despite its absurdity, it, it does continue to create death-dealing realities for BIPOC people and communities, especially black people. Um, and one of the things I appreciate most about your approach to anti-racism is the way you bring attention to design. Like how race lives productively in the designs of life, in the design of art, in the designs of every, every damn thing, um, and how we are collectively responsible. So can you describe what you mean when you say that everyone is a designer? And this is from Teresa's book, so make sure you check it out. <laughs> well, in my book, <laughs> I talk about, <laughs> uh, Lisa and I talk about how everyone is a designer. And we say this intentionally because uh, to design something means you're creating an experience. Um, and the way that we define design is based in three categories, uh, artifact, a system, and an experience. And everyone uh, has the ability and the agency to affect something like that. Um, yes, I am a graphic designer, so you know I'm creating communications and things like that. Um, but you can be an accountant and be perpetuating this system that was handed down to you that you're like, okay, we're using QuickBooks, like this is just what it's gonna be. Um, and you have the ability to shift, you know, that, um, that process. And so when we say that everyone is a designer, what we're doing is just trying to, um, I don't wanna say shifting blame, but it is almost like shifting blame. Cause oftentimes when we think about racism, we think about racism being this thing that's far away and that we don't actually have a hand in. And I think some of the comments even in the video were kind of talking about that, not just the structural, systemic, institutional part, but the interpersonal, the actions that I'm making towards someone, that part as well. And so saying that everyone is a designer means at every level, you know, you have the ability to affect some sort of change and then to design, to actually craft, you know, that artifact, that system or experience in an anti-racist or anti-oppressive way. That's really helpful, and I'm curious then, how, how can this idea of us being, all of us being designers, help us understand the ways white supremacy is nurtured? Like, we talked about the kind of absurd nature of it, but how can we, how can this shed light on how it's nurtured in this kind of ongoing way? I think it's about the fact that everyone has a hand in it. Um, I think it's about uh, recognizing really that agency piece and that whether you're white, you're black, you're indigenous, you're a person of color, um, we can all perpetuate systems of, um, that support white supremacy culture. Um, and so I think, I think that for me is the foundation for, as the answer to that question is that we all are in it. You regardless. Know, regardless of our identity, regardless of, you know, um, our class, you know, our disability status, like we're in it, we're all in it. Yeah, yeah. So then, so then thinking about how we're all in it, right, and we can also acknowledge that depending on how we show up racially in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality, in terms of, you know, able-bodiedness, whatever, we are in it differently, right, from different vantage points. Um, and so I'm curious, what unique differences, if any, do you see between the ways, say, black people or BIPOC folks or white people should think of their responsibility in relation to creating anti-racist realities? I don't know if that question makes sense. It, it does make sense, and it actually makes me think about one thing I did want to uh, bring back up from the conversation you were having with Danielle was uh, when I'm at a movie that's making fun of racism and a white person laugh, and I'd be like, <laughs> Should you be laughing at that? You know, like, and so it just it brings up the conversation about the nuance of like how people's lived experiences, you know, yeah. really inform how they can take in, you know, some of that comedy because it is we got to laugh to keep from down. Like it is really that right. for people of color, yeah. and I and I'll speak from about myself for black people in particular. Yeah. It is really about that, and so I think it's about you know it, the lived experience is really going to dictate how it is that we move in this in these spaces and 
I think the um, the agency that we have. Yeah. So as someone who is temporarily able body, someone who isn't trans, my voice can be a little bit louder for folks who are being oppressed underneath those systems. And that's the same way it is with racism. And I think one thing that I was hearing in the video, and I don't mean to, I don't wanna call nobody out, but one thing I was hearing <laughs> was this, um, this, this thought around futuring. And yeah. I love futuring, okay, don't get me wrong, but oftentimes we just go straight there. And it's because racism and oppression right now here in this very time makes us uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's like, black folks who are laughing at racism to try and like, I gotta see myself outside of this situation for a minute. It's completely different than folks who are just saying, you know, we just all need to, you know, get together and love each other. And you know, that's just, we're gonna solve it. And it's just like, stop, like sit in it. You know, my, in my, you know, 37 years of life, I've been sitting in it since yeah. I was born. And yeah. I need y'all to sit in it just for a little bit yeah. um, and be uncomfortable. And so for me, the, your positionality does really affect how I think you should show up to the conversation. It affects how much you should be giving up in the fight um, of racism, it affects um, uh, your ability to be able to speak for certain populations. So yeah, there, there, th it is very nuanced. Uh, I will not say that. It's not a, we're, you know, I'm definitely not binary. And when thinking about, you know, you know, you either you do this or you do this. Um, but I do think your positionality absolutely affects how you should be showing up to the conversation. Um, and I don't mean that in the way where it's like, if you show up to an anti-racist conversation, you're white, you need to speak. That's not at all right. what, I need, what needs to happen, right? right? I think that white folks do need to speak up more in these conversations because then it lets other white folks know that it's okay for them to speak up too. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of growing that needs to happen. Um, I heard one time someone speak about racism and like black folks have like a PhD in racism, whereas like white folks, you know, you're sort of still like in the, in like middle school, you know, <laughs> if that sometimes, you know, and, and the thing is, as an educator, I have to, I deal with that. Like people come into the classroom, they have all kinds of ways of thinking and, you know, and so we're pushing and exploring towards that. But it's like in a classroom, it feels like maybe a little more safe. Um, because students are assumed not to know anything, right? And they just, you know, so they can ask these questions and even then, you know, you still gotta push them to ask questions. But uh, in real life, it's like, I need folks to show up in this space the same way, you know? You don't know it, I don't know everything there is to know about racism, you know, even with the work that I do. I don't know, I definitely don't know everything there is to know about being trans or about being disabled or about having, you know, other forms of oppression that aren't my lived experience. So I'm gonna show up to those spaces differently, but I'm still gonna show up and engage. And I feel like oftentimes folks are so afraid, I heard that in the video too, yeah. afraid of saying something wrong yeah. that they don't say anything at all and what happens is I sit there and I get an email after the meeting and just like that's so messed up what that person said to you and it's like why didn't you speak up in the meeting what's wrong with y'all like yeah. please you know and uh, even if you don't know what to say like you know just speak up so I think um, positionality absolutely matters that's my point um, and <laughs> and what I need from people who are not comfortable talking about racism and understanding that it takes practice and it's not gonna start until you start yeah. and so you're gonna wait your whole life talking about well I just didn't want to say anything wrong and you know we're gonna be sitting over here still being oppressed and being killed by cops on the streets um, because you don't want to say anything wrong yeah. uh, and so the pressure is on you yes to speak up just like the pressure is on me to speak up for folks in the trans community um, so yeah no I, I appreciate that and, and it makes me think about how this is very much there's an element of educational process to this like we need to there are things we have to learn Right, it can't be, we can't be so hung up on the politic of it that we don't want to approach. And this is the idea behind the disruptive conversations and why we've tried to frame it as a way, a comedic way in because of how it allows us to engage. But I also appreciate your nuance in terms of the power dynamic is still there, right? When those spaces open up, these more vulnerable, more engaged spaces open up in conversation, we still have to be careful with the fact that there are people engaged in this kind of you know, conversation about the absurdity of something where a joke might get dropped and we laugh, but recognizing where we're situated in relation to that laughter. That to your point and to a point that Danielle has made in her book, that for, for black folks, 
laughter can be revolutionary. And, and much the reason why Chappelle talks about leaving the Chappelle show was because of a different kind of laughter that, that kind of moved differently. Um, and so I'm just curious, Danielle, if you wanted to weigh in on this, especially this question of just how positionality or people's standpoints relates to either the, the kind of comedic learning process of engaging these conversations, um, or even the way that we just relate to the, to the fact that we're all designers or we all have a kind of co-creative responsibility in terms of the world we live in now and the world that we're trying to bring about. Yeah, I mean, I think both of you all have have touched on this idea about that question of laughter and why people are laughing. That that question, Teresa, that I love that you brought up when you're hearing somebody laugh and you're like, okay, but why are you laughing, right? Like, what? I know why I think that's funny. <laughs> what, are you, what are you thinking is funny right now? And it really is that kind of space um, when we are aware that nothing is just jokes, yeah. right? That that there is a reason that for our laughter, there's a reason that we find it funny. If we can interrogate that for ourselves, um, regardless of our positionality, I think that can be a useful entry point into a conversation. Because are you laughing because it's so relatable to you? The the race, you know, if there's a joke about. Um, you know, black people do this, white people do that kind of joke. Are you laughing because you think it's true? Are you laughing because you recognize how this um, in reality, uh, you know, contributes to certain kinds of negative stereotypes against black people? Are you laughing because this is something you used to believe or you heard your parents say, but you recognize that it's false? What it, where is the laughter coming from? That becomes a space for growth, I think, and a space for opportunity where people can start to really um, think about the schemas that they have established about the world around them. Because laughter only occurs because something unexpected has happened or something happens that distorts our yeah. schema in yeah. some way. So yeah. what is your schema? How did that contribute to your laughing? And then how is that going to influence your actions later on yeah yeah that's juicy and and i love the language of schema and the way that you're using it um and so forewarning this next question is not on the notes i told y'all this was gonna happen so <laughs> you're well situated to respond to it um so okay so we think about schemas and how all of us have these kind of mental ways of processing relating um many of the time much of the time in ways that we have not kind of actively created Right, so we acknowledge that the messaging we get from cultural realities, advertisement, these things are actually designed to shape our schemas, to shape the way that we interact with each other in the world. And so, and we know, especially since Obama's administration, that there are concerted efforts um, to oppress, and one of the ways of doing that is to, to actively create schemas where, where this kind of consciousness does not register. So I'm curious to both of y'all, what are some of the examples of the, of the ways right now um, that there are these active attempts to recreate a racist world, um, whether subtle or whether they're more blatant in some of the political examples that we've seen? I'm just kind of curious how you all see um, what resistance is to the work that we're trying to do and the consciousness we're trying to bring do people need to be aware of? Um, so that when they see these things or interact with these stimuli, it's like, ah, no, 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 okay, I need to think about that. <laughs> um, I, I, my mind, I think, like, which one do I even talk about? Um, yeah. Affirmative action, you know, is that the one that I talk about? Uh, do I talk about Make America Great Again? Like, what is the example I'm going to bring forward? And... Um, I heard uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, she's the uh, person who created the 1619 Project, um, brilliant. Mm -hmm. And she was on stage talking about her project and she was talking about how um, Ibram X. Kendi in his book says, um, every time there is um, uh, anti-racist progress, there's racist progress. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get that backlash. And that backlash shows up in some of the examples that I just named. Like I think about affirmative action, you know, and 
this idea um, that <laughs> <laughs> this idea that I think was is totally skewed, right? And then factually, you know, uh, actually benefits more white women than it does black people at all. Um, and and how uh, folks will use that, you know, narrative to somehow take away credit or take away the work that black folks have done. Um, there's, I don't know, there's just so many examples and I don't even know what you should do when you see it. Like, I don't, I can't even get to that part of the question. Right. Um, because the, some of these things require policy, you know, they require you to be in a, a place of like power. Um, and if you're not, they require you to raise hell and are folks willing to do that right now? Um, are they, are we actually really to, willing to actually be that uncomfortable? I mean, if we want to really want to talk about abolitionist organizing, we can go there. Uh, but I think it requires much more than I don't know uh, that that yeah. I haven't seen yeah. folks really willing to give up yeah. for actual justice for yeah. people. Yeah, that's real. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to to add on to that, um, you know, I'm struck by how much the goalposts change all the time when in our anti racist actions and activism um that as soon as there is some progress made then suddenly the rules get changed um so when we're talking about you know um gosh even something as, as silly and you know since we're talking about comedy the way people used to say you know the way black people used to say you know stay woke about this and now woke means something entirely yeah. different in the political realm, right? right. That when we have um, a sort of um, lexicon that is meant to um, affirm our existence and, and affirm that the racism we're witnessing is real and that we're part of this community together, um, experiencing it and, and trying to fight against it, then suddenly that, that word becomes a dirty word it wow. you know it it loses the meaning for us and becomes this sort of this thing with negative connotations outside of its original meaning and so i think that the one thing the, i'm always drawn back to um derrick bell who um among many um incredible accomplishments. He was a, you know, Harvard law professor, um, one of the forefathers of critical race theory, um, taught Barack Obama, all of these, you know, um, wonderful things. But he also wrote um, a collection of essays and short stories called Faces at the Bottom of the Well, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, but the subtitle to Faces at the Bottom of the Well is The Permanence of Racism. And I'm always drawn back to that idea in thinking about anti-racism, that Derrick Bell, who had who was one of the people who really kind of came up with the terminology of critical race theory, viewed racism as something permanent, that it is a permanent fixture of American society. And so what do we do with that then? We perhaps recognize that racism is always going to exist because it's always going to take up the spaces that white supremacy needs it to take up. Um, and yet we are going to be compelled for the rest of our lives to fight against it, to try to stay one step ahead of whatever the new language, the new rhetoric, the new um, de jure, the new de facto regulations are going to be that our job is to stay vigilant, to stay woke and to be aware of the fact that that this battle continues forever. That that you know we're not we're not willing to give up the territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that so much because of when I think about how how this myth of post raciality is kind of the opposite of that, and how that really undermines anti racist efforts and energy. The, the presumption that, well, we've crossed some threshold, right? Um, and so now we don't have to be as vigilant or now people assume that they can be neutral because things are fair now. And they point to examples like, well, we've had a black president or we have this or we've had that. 
but without this ability to look at how the, the dynamics, the political dynamics play out continually in much the same way that they did during plantation era, during Jim Crow, it changes forms. Um, but we still are looking at this kind of broad scale um, disempowerment and dehumanization of people based on race, right? Um, and then you mentioned the language of progress, right? There'd be this post-racial narrative is one where we want to believe that we've made progress. Um, and yet, you know, the, the framing of tonight is, okay, well, how do we move into the not yet aspects of what we hope to exist in? And so I'm curious for both of you all, how can we think about or imagine what an anti-racist reality, reality not being something that is fixed, but reality being something that has kind of become real in the sense of like, when I look at it, 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 it this is real. How, what is the evidence of anti-racism, not the language of progress, but becoming real? Um, and, and to frame it even more and to while you're kind of pondering that, one of the things that I think about often and that I teach my students in class, we do a lot of analysis work, racial analysis work, and um, talk about the way that this is a cultural production and how it even enlists our emotions and intuitions in, in our bodies, we can recognize the reality of these things, oftentimes in a split second. And for me, um, one of the examples that makes this, that illustrates this for students, particularly white students, is when I ask the question, what, what happens in our bodies respectively when you see the, the lights in the rear view mirror? For me, um, regardless of what I am or am not doing, <laughs> When I see the lights in my rearview mirror and I'm getting pulled over, I notice instantly something happens in my body, right? There's a tension that comes about. There's this kind of awareness, this kind of go into fight or flight mode almost, or at least a readiness to go into that mode. Um, and I recognize that as automatic as that is, it's directly connected to the messaging, the meaning, and all of the things that we have learned uh, based on the ways that these interactions have gone in the past, whereas somebody else could have the same experience and would never have that embodied experience. And so for me, one of the e pieces of evidence that would let me know that this is becoming real, that a shift is happening, is when I begin to notice that that dissipates in my body when I'm getting, now hopefully I'm not getting pulled over enough <laughs> to you know, have a lot of data, <laughs> but the point is, <laughs> Um, when I start noticing those differences in my body, or if I'm leaving the gym or I'm leaving somewhere and there's a white woman walking directly in front of me, when I don't feel this, this compelled to stop, let her get a distance or go across the street or something like that, right? And so I'm just kind of curious from y'all's vantage points, whether in your own bodies or whether as you look into the world, how will we know that this is becoming real? I think that's a, even though you gave us all that space to think, I think <laughs> it's such a- Still coming it's up still short. A, yeah, it's, it's, such a, it's such a difficult question because for me, when I think anti-racism, I think in action. I think you are, it's, it's progress, like um, internalized progress, systemic change, uh, but I don't necessarily think I see an anti-racist world. Right. Um, I see a world that is centered in black liberation no. I see a world that was created through abolitionist ideologies. Um, I see freedom, yeah. um, but I don't necessarily know if I see anti-racism because that's like it's like that's the path to get there. That's not, yeah, that's good. you know, the 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 place that's good. yet. Yeah. And so, um, in describing Black liberation, yeah. I could I, I definitely see creative freedom. Um, I see holistic healing from the trauma, right? I see reparations. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> those those are some of the things that I see. That's how I would know that there's actual, there has been actual change made. And that's not to say that change hasn't been made. I feel like a lot of us younger folks who are organizers, you know, older elders think that like we're saying that they didn't do anything. And that's not true. Right. There still needs, there's still stuff that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, and so I'm gonna keep screaming from the mountaintop that stuff still needs to get done. Um, and so that's, that's what I see. I see liberation. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I appreciate that. I I love that response um, because I do. I think of anti-racism as an action, 
Um, and, you know, like I said, with, with Derek Bell, I just, I don't know that we ever get to the place where the action is, mm -hmm. where, where we're able to stop. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I think in my body, it would feel oh. rest. It would feel like a moment to really breathe and not feel guilt. Um, it would be a moment to rest and not then say, I'm resting up for the next battle. Mm -hmm. um, and I cannot imagine that. Right. Um, I love the point, um, Teresa, that you made about, you know, not ever wanting our our ancestors to feel like we're saying, oh, you all didn't do anything. You didn't do enough. That, again, these goalposts are changing. Um, you know, the civil rights movement had profoundly positive, you know, impacts and and the folks who were a part of that are um, heroic and I, you know, commend them and am, am grateful for, for all of that work. Um, and still there is more that we, that we're tasked with doing and that my children are going to be tasked with doing and that their children will inevitably be tasked with doing as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, I like to imagine a sense of rest. Um, I don't know that that kind of rest, that that sort of um, rest ever, ever comes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a radical rest uh, <clears throat> that you're talking about. And yeah, I don't, I don't, as much as I do all of this work and I remain hopeful, this is why I do it. I also have a hard time actually seeing when that rest will be, mm -hmm. even if we did get our reparations checks tomorrow, <laughs> you know, I'm still going to have to deal with, with the woman in the grocery store who's going to come and touch my hair for no freaking reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that cultural shift takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and I even, I'm thinking about even, you know, the civil rights movement and, and right before MLK, you know, was murdered, you know, he started even saying these things, right? About like, oh, we're actually going into a burning house. Like, yeah. I remember that being a quote from yeah. him yeah. as he actually really started to, to like, like really develop his ideologies and yeah. then like, boom, he was murdered. And so I, I think there's like, even, even in the civil rights movement, That's it was right. noticed that like, we still got a lot of change that needs yeah. to happen. Like there's still a lot that needs that, that's gonna, it's gonna be left after um, these policies are passed. Yeah. So I don't know that I would love to see it. Uh, and I, and I remain hopeful, but I don't, I don't know if that will ever be experienced by me and even two, three generations after me. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And even, and even Danielle, you mentioned in uh, Derek Bell's framing of the permanence of, re of, of racism and how that can keep us in this kind of more vigilant, active uh, mode of being. And yet I, I'm, I also, I ask this question because of imagination, because our imaginations can often get marred by reality as it currently is. And even, and even the, the kind of, uh, not fatalistic, but certainly a critical realist look into the future at what's probably gonna happen, right? Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, depictions of, um, you know, Wakanda, right, for example, and, and Black Panther, and how these, these kind of futurist or fictional spaces that can, that can, that we, that give us an opportunity to imagine different futures and different possibilities, um, the way that that works on the schemas that are being created in Black children's mind, for example. And so I'm just reflecting on this tension between imagination and the kind of realism of what we've been dealing with and what we will continue to deal with. And maybe as a last question before we go into Q&A, how can we in a healthy way hold the tension between those, those ways of kind of thinking about this work? I, I think um, one thing I have learned in doing this type of work is to value the nuance. And that is what we're in all the time, constantly. And I think if you can hold the nuance for your partner, hold the nuance for your friend, your family member, um, hold the nuance for everyone else. And I think if you are able to do that, which really what I just described is empathy, yeah. if you're able to build that up, um, you're able to hold the nuance of like both a very shitty world and yeah. also one that we hope will get better. Yeah. 
Um, and I think uh, for me, that's been my why, why I continue to do this work is that, yeah, it's really bad. Um, and also it can be really good. And yeah. so let's try and strive for that. Um, but I do find that I need intentional time to take myself out yeah. of, of, of it for a little bit, you know, um, sabbatical would be nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, yeah, that's, that's my, my answer to that. Thank you, Tessa. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think holding on to the small victories is also a way to, um, to not grow weary um, with the work that you recognize where you can see little things, little moments that are going to make things easier in some capacity, at least temporarily for the people who come after you. Oftentimes in a lot of the work I'm doing, I recognize that maybe it's not going to help me, but you know, it'll help the other black faculty who come after me on my campus, yeah. or it will help the other black folks in my community or in my neighborhood or, you know, um, across the country, what, whatever it is that recognizing that there are these moments, even if they're going to be fleeting, even if we know that the stakes are going to change, that the goalposts are going to get moved, that for a moment there, it might, um, slide your foot in the door and let a few more folks in. Um, that for me is something that helps me continue doing the work, even when I get particularly discouraged. And absolutely the taking my taking myself out of it sometimes and saying, I, you know, I've I've done stuff. I, I need to not do a thing for a while. I need to not be a part of this because I need to take care of myself because I'm not good for anybody if I if I don't give myself that space. And recognizing that doesn't mean, you know, that I'm not committed, that, you know, that I'm letting people down but just that this is the way I have to take care of myself so that I can take care of other people. Yeah. Um, and really believing that, really, you know, truly believing that without guilt. Um, that is still a struggle for me, but that, <laughs> is, that is still my, my effort is believing without guilt, I need to take this time yeah. um, for myself. Yeah, thank you, thank you both. So we have about <clears throat> 13 minutes for Q&A. <laughs> and so good luck. Uh, we have microphones to pass around, so if at this time, if there's anybody who has questions for either presenter or general questions for any one of us to respond to, we have some time. Also for Zoomers, uh, if you, mm, maybe somebody can monitor the chat. Uh, if a Zoomer has a question, we can either unmute and articulate that themselves or on their behalf. First of all, thank you. Thank you. All three of you, thank you. Um, so in this great creative play space, I love the design element of things, right? So designing a community that we're building into an anti-racism uh, commitment, a reality, create a play <laughs> where you walk in this space or any space and where you do feel a, you can breathe, right? And, and, a, and a breath mm -hmm. and the commitment to do, and, the, and what commitments look like that you know deep down that this institution or an institution, remember we're a church group institution which is inherently racist and full of white supremacy culture um, but training students in spiritual leadership to confront these systems is really a big deal for us. Um, but does that mean we need to, as an institution, take on um, a powerful commitment to abolition, right, of, to reparations? What, what, what are all the things that we need to do uh, to take down some of the to decenter whiteness in the names and the and how we tell our history and and um, we we have a we we have a the BIPOC history too, but we don't tell it, mm. you know, in this institution mm. and in the church. Yeah. So, how, what what do you think? What would you suggest to to play? Let's play a little bit in the in the spirit of 
Dr. Green. No. Uh, yeah, so I can, I can start off um, with an answer to that. Um, one way that I like to uh, start my class uh, in the semester, and I'll spend like a week and a week and a half on this, on positionality, and the three questions that I ask is, uh, who am I, and then who are you, and then who are we? Um, and so really understanding my own positionality and then building empathy for your positionality and then understanding how our positionalities can work together in a space um, helps build the foundation. And so I think um, you all have kind of already done some of that work or are going into that work from what I've seen in the video. Um, so that, that's a starting place there. Um, I will also say that there's a ton of resources out there that already exist, um, but uh, one that I really like is Tema Oaken's work around white supremacy culture. Um, and if you don't know of that, I just sent it over to my mom like last week and we were talking about it. And um, not only are, is there like, here is all the bad things, right? But then there's anecdotes on there. And there's things that tell you, you know, here's the way that you can combat some of those things. So I'm thinking about, um, as a recovering Christian myself, uh, I'm thinking about <laughs> things that are similar and white supremacy culture in the church as they are in academia. And I think about worship of the written word and how you know folks will only take this thing and they twist it up how they want and all this. And so there's all there's 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 all these different points in how you can interact with that um, and then make that like a living practice. And so I would say uh, with the resource that I, one of the resources that I just gave you, um, I think that there are many ways that you can like really study o um, oppression, and I think that's the next step after positionality. So start off with the who am I, yeah. who are you, who are we, and then really dive into what oppression looks like because once you know when, what who you are, and that knowing who you are does not stop at the <laughs> at that first week, right? It's continued continued practice. But at least you kind of know, you know, okay, now I'm talking about this and this is my positionality in this conversation. Um, and diving deep into understanding of systems of oppression and how you show up and perpetuate those things is gonna be the next step. And then that's a lifelong practice, right? So positionality and then understanding oppression, um, I would say is like the first, is, is the steps. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to Michael to build on that, which that's perfect because she, then you, or, or Teresa, you're speaking to just the kind of necessary, to your point, f foundational work that has to be in place for people to do this kind of work. For me, I'm thinking about as we think how, how to build on that and in terms of positionality, right? If you, if you have done this kind of educational work, if you have taken the time to learn how to see, right and can imagine the way that you would hope a reality or an interaction or something would look like i'm talking at the kind of personal level now um you're situated culturally in a in a space where you know kind of the interworkings of the world you live in right and and becoming aware of your positionality from the standpoint of where you where you have access to power where are you situated in relation to power but recognizing that 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 this is a recreative act to try to bring something about that doesn't exist, right? You're creating something that does not exist and where you're uniquely situated to facilitate the, the little small victories that Danielle's talking about, recognizing that those victories are all productive. We interact different, you know, we interact in a certain way nine times out of 10, but on the 10th day, something happens where one of us creatively disrupts this thing and all of a sudden something opens up. But that's something where, and, and if it, I think we get hung up trying to look for the kind of existent best practices or what are the things I can do that can be kind of standardized as opposed to what's the, the, the intelligence, the understanding that I need to employ my creative sensibilities in relation to whatever this, this situation is. And I would hope that we could begin to make that shift. Where are you situated in relation to this reality? And how can you playfully, not, not, not devoid of criticality, but if you think about the word recreation, it's recreation. How can you playfully recreate this interaction in a way that opens up possibilities for it to grow into something new? We have a uh, question on Zoom. So Tamise, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, my question is for Dr. Fuentes Morgan. Um, I think Dr. Green, you probably just answered my question, but I'm still going to ask it because I had it in my head a certain way. My bad. Uh, <laughs> but but I just wanted to ask this question of how do you see or what ways do you see satire and comedy? The reason I'm asking is when you were talking about punching up, it made me think of Walter Wink and Jesus's third way and all of that type of things. And thinking about how do you see sort of satire and comedy and wordplay aiding in like revolution and resistance mm. just as much as it aids in rest. Like, do you, could you speak to that a little bit? I love that question. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, part of what comedy does and does effectively is give us um, not only the uh, co a cover of plausible deniability, which allows folks to, um, kind of insidiously make these jokes to plot, to plan, to talk to each other, to form community, and then dismiss it and pretend when, um, you know, the stakes are high or when there's danger afoot that like, oh, it was just a joke. You know, we recognize that just jokes don't exist, but it's still, I mean, comedians make this excuse um, today. Oh, it was just a joke. You're taking it too seriously. They know it's not just jokes because it's literally their livelihood. They, you know, it, so there's that kind of protection um, that comedy allows. I think also um, the space to remind yourself that you are putting one over on the oppressor. Um, we brought up wordplay, which I think is um, underrated in terms of how sophisticated yes. a form of comedy it is um that that it is very difficult to um come up with wordplay that is um clever and um meaningful and also easily discernible to your audience um for all three of those things to happen it has to be this kind of nice intersection of um your own intelligence and the intelligence of your listener and your um, way of tapping into both of those things. And so I think that that the fact that comedy and satire are ultimately intellectual spaces made accessible is a really critical way um, of utilizing comedy for the revolution. Bell mm -hmm. Hooks says specifically also um, that we cannot have a meaningful revolution revolution without humor. Um, and she was very, very deliberate in talking about the need of humor in rev in revolution, that, that it doesn't work. She said whenever people, she, she specifically says, I think whenever the left gets humorless, they lose. And I, I think, and I carry that with me because it's, it's true. It's, you know, if we are taking it too seriously, oh. How can we think about the absurdity of white supremacy? Mm -hmm. How can we recognize the ridiculousness of racism if we're taking it all too seriously, if we aren't allowing that playfulness in? I wanna say something briefly, um, since this is a seminary space and then we have time for probably one more question, but go back and read, <clears throat> go back and read the gospels through a, through a comedic lens and watch the way you start to notice the, the satirical devices that Jesus was using. Um, and so, you know, how, how you make sense of, of Jesus and divinity and, 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 and his messiahhood, also pay attention to how comedy and satire was a centerpiece to the ways that he was disrupting and trying to bring about this revolutionary way of engaging and thinking. Um, do we have another question? <laughs> Hi, thank you for, uh, for being here tonight. It was a lovely presentation. I've enjoyed every single moment. Thank you. Um, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm a current student in human services um, pursuing an undergraduate degree. And one of the things that I sometimes struggle with in the classroom is that something will happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, like just the other night, a white um, classmate said, I don't want to sound racist, but I don't like when immigrants get here and start complaining about this country, which felt very racist. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, taking into what you're speaking about, we don't want to make an unsafe space. I didn't want to, like, jab out of bitterness and anger because then I'm afraid they'll 
then it'll be remain closeted. Right. They won't have the space to express these opinions. Right. And in that nanosecond, it's like, do I step into an educational role, which is what I ended up doing. Like, you know, just remember that sometimes people can't critique governments for safety of their life, their well-being, and America gives us that opportunity. But I really wanted to crack the joke like, oh, so it kind of bothers you that people come here and do what this country gives them the right to do. And, you know, in those nanoseconds, how do you kind of like decide what might be best for that situation? Um, so y'all can talk to the comedy piece because I'll, I'll be laughing about it. <laughs> <laughs> Shit ain't funny. Um, so uh, one thing that I have learned through facilitating, through having, um, cl you know, doing classes and, and facilitating students um, is to slow down. And, you know, um, I do think a joke is funny. You know, you can you make a joke. But one thing that I will say is is a tool that y'all can put in your tool, your toolbox or your, your belt, whatever it is you wear, uh, is this phrase, can we pause? OK, can we pause? That's all you have to say. And you can literally say, I don't know what to say right now. I feel like my energy has shifted. I feel like something was said that, that it feels a little off to me. Literally talk about the feelings that are happening in your head. Yeah. Because then you break down the walls and people stop being so, this Minnesota passiveness, we were just talking about it. It bothers the crap out of me. I'm from the South. And so y'all don't be talking about stuff and y'all need to talk about it, okay? <laughs> and y'all throw me in the middle and I'm just like, y'all had this beef for 10 years and y'all ain't said nothing. <laughs> So can we pause and literally talk about what is happening in your head? This thing is bothering me. You know, something was said and I'm not really sure if it was, you know, you don't have to say don't, you don't have to say anything binary. I don't know if it was right. You don't have to say that, but just, you know, I feel a little off right now. My center is a little off scent. Like I feel a little, you know, jilted. Like what, you know, say something um, that is going on in your head to just pause the conversation. And um, one of the things about white supremacy just likes to move forward. Right, um, and that's one of the things I've been trying to get my department to to just like, can we at the beginning of a meeting just check in? You know, <laughs> there's a whole, you know, uh, conflict happening right now in in Israel and Gaza. Can we just check in with each other? Yeah. You know, and uh, and so just can we pause? That would be my advice for anybody who you know is that person who sends me an email after the meeting. You know, talking about I'm that's so messed up. Say, can we pause in that meeting? Can we pause? Yeah. Why you just, you know, touch old girl's hair? You know, something. Make your joke then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that would be my advice for that situation. Danielle, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, what I, I, I think the pausing is crucial. Um, and as a professor in my department, what I usually do, because I, um, I teach... Um, African-American literary courses, African-American culture and literature courses. Um, and so I get a wide array of students taking those courses for a wide variety of reasons, um, including some, you know, some who are, I, I'd say a third of my students come in, they are ready to put in the work. A third are not certain what the course entails, but they're gonna give me the benefit of the doubt. They're gonna see how it goes. Another third come in and they are calling the course their diversity course and they are not, they're just not about it. Um, and maybe I'm gonna be able to persuade them by the end of it, maybe not. Um, and so to sort of fairly engage with the level of rigor we need in that course and to open up space for conversations, on the first day of classes, I um, talk really candidly to my students about what white supremacy means, um, how we're going to talk about it, um, the kinds of language we can and cannot use. Uh, we have a conversation about various uh, forms of privilege. Sometimes we throw in Roxanne Gay's um, essay, Peculiar Benefits, so we talk about the various ways people have privileges. Um, and then we recognize that in my classroom, we are a community of learners and we are um, creating a um, culture of care in that space. And what that means is that we are going to consider how our language and how the things we say are going to impact how other people in that classroom feel and whether or not they feel safe. That it's okay to feel uncomfortable, it's okay to feel um, 
challenged, it is not okay to, to feel unsafe or to make other people feel unsafe. Yeah. And once we have that kind of language engaged, students tend to be um, at least, they, they tend to avoid some of the uh, verbal diarrhea pitfalls that students have when they're engaging with literature or material that is unfamiliar to them, that's bringing up feelings that they haven't. Um, had space to express before. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that somebody's not going to say something like, you know, I feel um, angry when immigrants come over and, you know, X, Y, and Z, but it means that um, we can pause and, and the class is prepared for that pause to take place. And that student is prepared to be self-reflexive and think about what that, what they said, um, and if there was a different way for them to say what they said, if they meant something different, or if they need to interrogate why that was their initial feeling. Um, because it's not about making them feel the same way I feel. It's about making them, it's about providing them with the tools to understand where their gut reactions are coming from and um, what sort of productive reactions are possible too. Then, yeah, I, I, I appreciate both of those responses. And I had similar thoughts about kind of what the role and responsibility of a professor in a class like that would be in terms of not taking for granted the space that is shared. Um, but I would take what you said and I would I would apply that or I would invite people more broadly to think about that also, in, not just in the classroom. Don't take space, shared space for granted. Because when a, when, a, when a space, when a room, when an when a experience or interaction is curated intentionally, there are things that can happen in that space that otherwise cannot when we show up on the presumptions of that we're just you know, sharing space randomly. Um, and so whatever spaces that you're moving in relation to, especially if you have a responsibility to that shared space as a leader or as a curator or a facilitator, take the time to set the intention, take the time to get people present in the way that you want to be, and then watch the kind of magic that can happen in a space like that. Um, I want to say thank you again to Dr. Danielle Fuentes Morgan and Teresa Moses for showing up. And I also want to thank Uzama Obasi, who's a friend of mine who uh, we worked together on creating this film. Uh, the administration at United for um, seeing this need and responding to it and, and allowing us to have creative freedom to do this in a way that is unique and that can galvanize intention and, and really kind of raise people's consciousness in a different way. Um, again, to Danielle and Teresa, thank you. And then thank you all for everybody for coming out. Um, I hope that this is the beginning of something powerful. I believe it is. Um, this, is, this will happen once per term, these conversations, um, and it will live in relation to the broader rhythm that was shared in the video. Um, there's an opportunity for follow-up conversation. I want to make one announcement and then we'll dismiss, but um, we have social transformation lunches every month. And the next one is Tuesday, uh, November 14th. And so that will be entitled Reorienting Ourselves, a Follow-Up Conversation. And so if you have not already attended the ST lunches, uh, consider attending that. I will be there. Dr. Sabia Tanis will be there. Uh, Rai Sigelko of the, of the Center for Social Justice here will be there. And we'll be in dialogue about what, what, what sense do we make of this. It'll be an opportunity for us to continue this work. So thank you all and good night. Thank you.